Iceland is an island of 300,000 people, a rather big island, 100,000 square kilometers, so, so uh, only three people per square kilometer. And, uh, but most of the central of Iceland is uninhabited, the volcanoes and glaciers. Uh, Iceland was one of the poorest nations in Europe until uh, the 20th century. So people were basically farmers and fishermen, <coughs> mostly farmers. But then when uh, modern times came in and uh, we started fishing and uh, having trade with other countries, then uh, we very soon became 300,000 when, when child mortality was erased. So now I think we actually have the lowest child mortality rate in the world, actually. And uh, so Iceland actually became rich in the World War II. Uh, there were a few fishing boats that were uh, shut down, but basically because Iceland was occupied by the British and then the Americans, uh, they brought in lots of resources and machines and uh, and things that uh, changed Icelandic dram Iceland dramatically so people started moving even quicker from the countryside into towns and cities and uh, so you could say that that uh, just before the Second World War we had the Great Depression and then came like an economic boom and then after we spent all the money that came from the army we went down and then came the herring and then the herring vanished and then we went down and we started fishing cod and then they managed to get a uh, deal with an aluminum company so a billion dollars came in so we went up again and then when they finished the construction that went down again so the Icelandic economy has always been going quite sharply up and down and people are actually quite adapted to kind of economic changes so there comes a big opportunity people seize it and then it vanishes and uh, and that has almost become a metaphor so the bubble is what we always want to be in we always want to we kind of know that there will be another bubble really? We know that it was fun during the internet bubble and then it was not fun anymore and then came the government and they signed a deal with Alcoa to build a huge dam and a smelter in the north and everybody knew that there would be a bubble and the bubble would, yeah, it would be, uh, but the problem is that that bubble came at the same time the housing bubble in Europe Lots of fin finance was going on. It came at the same time the banks were privatized. So that bubble started to feed upon the aluminum bubble. So the billion dollars that came with the aluminum, they were maximized into 10, 100 billion dollars. And uh, with debt and uh, acquiring companies all over the world, uh, so this is kind of the spark that ignited the bubble. But what I think is the problem while a normal stock bubble bursts and nothing kind of happens, uh, when you damage the land to make a bubble that's very dangerous. Yeah, so because of the banking bubble, uh, it's very difficult for people to get their first home now. You know, it should be easy. It should be easier to live now than it was 10 years ago or 20 years ago. You know, there's technological advance. There's all sorts of things, but uh, the the debt was poured upon the houses. So now people have to spend uh, almost a full month's wage to get an apartment somewhere. Which is, which is very strange and it's just because of banking I think because the houses were here before you know there's no so 
and the houses had been paid for building the houses, so why should they suddenly become so expensive, more expensive than it costs to live? Iceland was a colony for 600 years and then came the American army and you could say in some ways that uh, that was almost like being an annex of the army. You know, we could have our local politics but the big politics were very much based on that. And then you could say that the uh, our relationship with heavy industry was very colonial because we take all the debt to build the energy resources and we sell it extremely cheap with the only benefit of creating a few jobs for a few people but not not getting the real value of selling the resources. Just like Jamaica that sells us the raw material or, or sends it to Iceland, they don't get any real benefit from it. Really? Yeah, so Dreamland is a, is a semi-sarcastic title, so uh, it's often presented as a Dreamland, as a utopia. Uh, and then we have all sorts of forces that are creating this dystopia on the Dreamland. And uh, one person's utopia is another person's dystopia, so like uh, the energy officials dream of damming all the rivers, well, I think that is a very terrible idea to do. So, uh, so it's also about a platform for ideas, like uh, this is possible, something else is also possible. So it's like a, yeah, like a platform for ideas. Yeah, so the banks were given handed over to people very close to the government during privatization. Banks expanded, triple, quadruple, tenfold in, uh, in only 10 years. They started to buy businesses all over the world. Uh, a person would go from running a company with 100 people to 10,000 people in countries they had only a few times been to, so uh, so uh, and this created a lots of kind of super individuals, like supermen within the island that and super families that were slowly becoming kind of the the most dominant families on the island. Really? The group that crashed is trying to rise and change rewrite history according to the crash not being local but being something that came from abroad. Yes, yeah, so the debt that was the banks had did not, not all land on the, the nation. So 90% of that was just against other institutions, other banks, you know, Deutsche Bank or uh, or other banks abroad. So that's why the rise of the bubble, much of the money was just kind of international finance money that never kind of came here or fell upon the people on the island. Really? So the new constitution uh, has was written and it was outsourced to the people it was a big gathering of 1,000 people and then uh, a committee that kind of wrote the new constitution. Uh, this work was, was kind of, has been, the new government has been trying to demolish that work and reclaim all the old system back. And basically it's because of very uh, damaged people at the top level. Uh, like one of the most influential prime ministers, he once gave out that you should always just go against what the other is doing, no matter what he's doing. You should just go against it. So he's a very uh, 
we are very lucky that he's not a person that controls an army or something. You know, he's he's just uh, behind the desk, so he can't do any real damage, maybe financial damage or or uh, throw out some ugly comments. But so he's now the editor of the main newspaper here, one of the main newspapers. So that group is kind of following that dem that idea of demolishing the new constitution. The tourist boom has has uh, created lots of has cushioned lots of the effect of the crisis because that is has become the most the biggest inflow of uh, foreign currency and, and trade in Iceland. So uh, so tourism, fisheries, uh, we have quite a lot of energy. Those sectors have been kind of still being here. Really? So this this Icelandic triple miracle is something that Spanish journalists want to present in Spain because they want that to happen in Spain. And you know the the complex reality of Iceland is is a bit too complex actually to to make a good story. <laughs> it is, uh, it's, it's all in greys and shades and uh, knots and uh, detours. So it's not as clean cut. So just like Germans wish that there was a place in the world where you are a modern nation, still living in almost untouched natural beauty, still being able to talk to elves, and still being modern, creative, so you can play rock music for your grandmother. <laughs> you know, so that's kind of the dreamland that the Germans wish. And uh, and so Iceland is very often and has throughout the centuries been like a dreamland, a place where you can also project your wishes upon and report from Iceland what you wish could be possible in the world. Basically, the energy authorities have been promising cheap energy from damming our rivers and geothermal areas and claiming that it's clean energy, but it's not totally clean because you have to, uh, you have to dam rivers and, uh, and uh, destroy very beautiful geothermal areas. And, uh, and then you have to take an enormous debt. So the real profit from this is not actually ending up in Iceland. That's what we have done here in Iceland. Iceland's house is hit with the water, with the water. And that's what we have done really well. Yeah, so the good thing about it is how they heat our houses with hot water. And that's a system made after the crisis in 1930 to pump hot water from the ground circulate into the houses and that is really sustainable that's and it's not built on depth that was built very on very conservative kind of step to step development yeah, so the hitmen don't only have to come from abroad you know, if you own a big contracting company if 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 the lobby group is big enough then they can use the same methods as the hitmen. That is, they present all sorts of economic benefits that are totally false. But the politicians and maybe the public believe will give you prosperity. It's just like uh, when you meet a person selling jewelry on the street. And he says, yeah, you buy this, and you, you sell it at home, triple price, you know. And then everybody gets like small greed in their eyes. And I think this is what happened with the energy, that it appealed to people's kind of greed, that uh, you could become rich, you could have an easy life, a very easy income. And it's the same story everywhere, how this works. Really? So aluminum is, comes from Jamaica, it's washed with caustic soda, it's brought to Iceland, they leave 
much of the red mud behind in in the primitive countries uh, very damaging and then the other is brought to Iceland and uh, Iceland for example and the process is extremely energy intensive it takes like energy like one million people to open one plant and then aluminum is very often wasted for cans like in America they throw away like one million tons a year only in cans so uh, it's a terribly wasteful process and uh, I don't think we should sacrifice nature for such an unsustainable business so the pollution from a smelter would be CO2, fluoride and also uh, smaller heavy what do you call these? Uh, heavy metals, heavy <laughs> and uh, and it is uh, perhaps not kind of the long term effect of the pollution. The short term effect is not very obvious, but uh, the long term effect has not been quite uh, resolved. So the aluminum industry pretends to export three billion dollars or something worth of aluminum from Iceland. And people believe that is something that we are getting. But we're only getting a fragment of that. So that is why much of the population has tended to support the aluminum industry because uh, uh, the small kind of for a small town that is declining, it's very important to get a smelter. For the whole nation in whole, it, 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 it's, not, it's not make or break for us, for making a living. So, so five very small towns can cause great damage on the whole island just because of their local interest, very, very small local interest. The government had a plan of building five or six huge smelters. They already built uh, like three. The plan was to build two or three more. So what happened during the collapse was that the financial ground for making these plants was wiped out. So uh, they were going to build a plant in the north, a plant in the south and maybe one other plant three huge plants and uh, and that construction all is on hold so now you can if you go to Kepler you can take a picture of an unfinished plant that is huge but it's it's empty there's nothing going on there and they were t trying to take advantage of the government hoping to get cheap energy for that plant but those plants plants have been uh, Those plants have been wiped out. The international aluminum market, when you have a plant that uses energy like one million people, and uh, Putin controls the, the power of Europe, and uh, Americans are already in a war because of oil, um, it becomes quite obvious that a plant with one energy for one million people is not very sustainable either in Europe or in in, uh, in, uh, in America. So they have been seeking places that are unconnected to the international, to a big energy grid. So like Iceland, where nobody will come and unplug the factory because a million people would like to use it. So, uh, and this gives them better control over prices. Uh, this gives them great control over the local government, and the local influence. While if they're living in a place of 20 million people, they will just tell them to leave. So it gives them much more strategic power. So that's why they're going to Saudi Arabia, where they can get uh, gas-powered aluminum. They've been building up in China, 
where they can dam all the rivers, especially for aluminum. That's part of the the uh, madness taking place in China. They've been going to see Siberia, where they can dam a whole river only for one smelter, and then they have been trying to go to Iceland. But now there is an over capacity of aluminum in the world, so the aluminum prices have been going down. The reason why nobody is coming is because aluminum is kind of the only industry in the world that uses so much energy. Even a data center would not use so much energy. They would use maybe 20 megawatts or maybe 50 megawatts, while an aluminum smelter uses 600 megawatts, which is like the city of Copenhagen. So either we could move all the industries and all the people of Copenhagen to Iceland to use the power, but there's also an idea of making a cable to Europe. And also I think which is the best idea is not to harness the energy and make the waterfalls fall and flow as nature. <laughs> yeah, so Alcoa is owned by it's a multinational corporation. I don't know who don't know if there is any main owner of it. And they're based in Switzerland and in America in Amsterdam. And Glencore has another smelter here. And they are the biggest commodity company in the world. And they're quite a quite ruthless company. And I don't think they're very very nice. Really? So people are generally maybe not thinking so much when nothing is kind of in, immediately endangered. But it's not it's often not until things have been decided by the government that people wake up and say hey you're going to destroy this area and and uh, activists tend to be a bit late here so so this is why we are working on kind of preventional activism it is telling people to think before they plan really so we have huge pension funds that are becoming very powerful here which is of course a bit strange we have huge fisheries that are powerful, we have uh, political groups that are very powerful. But I'm not sure what... I haven't seen like any single foreign conglomerate that I could see as a, as a threat. And uh, we are discussing if we should go into the... If we should enter the EU or... Or uh, what to do? We we are uh, we don't know. Okay. When things go out of balance, they become difficult. So yes, maybe one smelter in Iceland would be okay. You know, let's take part in the global aluminum smelting fund. You know, but but when you can't, it's like. Uh, these people that take the bottle of the whiskey and they throw away the tap. They, they take the tap off and they throw it away because they're just going to finish everything. It's, you know, okay if you plan for one smelter, but why do the engineers have to plan to dam every river for a smelter? You know, why, why didn't they decide to take half or one third or just two rivers? Why did they have to plan for every river? Uh, the banks. Okay, they can give us some loans, but they, why do they have to make us total slaves <laughs> and make themselves also slaves? Because the person working in the bank is also a slave. You know, they, they are also struggling to buy a house or something on the debt that their own bank is lending them. So uh, many of these things, it's difficult to find the bad person and the good person. And it's like we have stumbled collectively upon some very strange ideology that is destroying the planet, destroying kind of just our day-to-day -day life, making it, everything impossible in some ways, and uh, and not putting the resources into the school system, into fixing the environment, into creativity. It's uh, and I think that's what we're trying to do, like in this factory that we are. 
behind <laughs> is to just change it on a small scale rather than and see if that can have some influence. Yeah, it's it's very hard to say where we're going. It's like um, Iceland has lots of things that we can has quite more than enough to live a good life without that. <laughs> and um, for some reason, we managed to be very greedy and and take in all the depth in hope to become rich, which is we became the opposite. And in some ways, it's also happening to the planet itself. So we have more than enough for everybody to live a good life. But then come all sorts of both greed, ideology, and uh, inequality, basically. So uh, the unequal distribution of resources is is uh, is based on an ideology that that has gone bankrupt, but it doesn't seem like we are able to take the step into uh, the other system. And I think that's something that many people are looking for and hoping that we can actually do without having some kind of a war before or some kind of a, some, some big trouble. Hello!